Join me today to chat about one of my favorite cozy mystery series. Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Feasting on Fiction. Tonight it is me, uh, Anne, talking about the Liz Talbot Mystery Series by Susan M. Boyer. Uh, her series of books begins with Low Country Boil, and this is a really great cozy mystery series. There's lots of food. Uh, obviously by the title, it takes place in the Low Country, which has a wonderful local cuisine and heritage. So I wanted to talk to you you guys about the series, get more of you reading it because I really think that it's it's top notch. Um, so to start off with, who is Liz Talbot, our heroine? She is a private investigator. She is a foodie for sure. She's also a germaphobe, doesn't go anywhere without her hand sanitizer. She is a lover of designer clothes and accessories. Uh, she's ruined more than one pair of Kate Spade shoes, I believe, as she goes through in her investigations. When the series opens, uh, she's living in Greenville, South Carolina, working with her partner, Nate, who's also a private investigator. She's divorced and sort of pining over her college love, who's still back home uh, on an island called Stella Maris, which is a fictional island off the coast of South Carolina. Stella Maris means star of the sea in Latin, and that was sort of an ancient name for the Virgin Mary. Just an interesting bit of trivia there, because Stella Maris and star of the sea both sound gorgeous to me. So a little background for those of you that might not be familiar with sort of what low country refers to. The South Carolina low country most commonly refers to the southernmost four counties of the state as far as the mainland goes, and then also the offshore islands, which are sometimes known as the resort islands. Um, Hilton Head is one of them and probably the most well-known. Uh, historically, this was a sort of an area where cotton, rice, indigo, that was their trade. That was how they survived, made money. They depended heavily on the port of Charleston, which obviously is still a very important port in the U.S. Uh, as things changed, agriculture became less important, and now tourism is sort of the dominating economic force in the area. The city of Charleston and the island specifically draw millions of tourists every year. Now, culturally, the area has an incredibly rich heritage. Being a port area, you know, with Charleston and, and the islands, there are Native American roots, European roots, uh, Caribbean and African, a really rich mix of, of cultures all residing in that area and, and adding to the lifestyle and, of course, the cuisine of the area. So the cuisine of the Low Country really reflects this diverse array of cultures. It has really strong African influences. And you can see many parallels to sort of the, the Cajun cuisine of Louisiana. Uh, now, the first book is called Low Country Boil and, of course, takes its name from the area's signature dish, which is a mix of generally shrimp, corn, and sausage with some spices. You boil it all together. You serve it by scooping up giant amounts of it and sort of throwing it on a paper plate. And if you eat it anywhere but on a sunny patio. I don't know if that's allowed, but um, it is definitely the, the the signature dish of the the area. Now, the low country version tends to be a little less spicy than the Cajun cousin that you would get in Louisiana, New Orleans. But of course, if you're making one, you can adjust it, make it as spicy as you want. The dish is also sort of the signature dish of one of the locations that figures prominently in all the books. A restaurant on Stella Mars called the Pirate's Den, which is owned by a couple of our secondary characters, the Glendons. Um, and the, the low country boil being their specialty kind of gets mentioned a couple times as people enjoy it. I guess they're not eating it outside. We'll forgive them because the Pirate's Den sounds like a cool place to go with live music and karaoke and things like that. So we'll give them a pass. They probably couldn't hear the karaoke if they took their low country boil outside. There's a lot of things to like about this series. And sort of my main thing, my main issue with a lot of cozy mystery series is that our heroine generally unfortunately tends to sort of bumble into things. Um, and this is a generalization. They don't all do that. But, you know, in many cases, it's book after book of, you know, she's stumbling upon a murder. She's going to somehow often accidentally find the solution to this murder. Um, sometimes she's going to sort of, you know, she, she fancies herself a wonderful investigator. So she gets started much to the annoyance of cops and men folk, which that's another annoyance I sometimes have is the, the men folk being maybe a little more overprotective than necessary, which I guess I can understand if your lady friend keeps stumbling into murders year after year. I guess it could get a little, a little nerve wracking, right? But the thing about Liz is that because she's a private investigator, first of all, her involvement doesn't feel weird in many cases through uh, these books, she's being hired to solve an issue, whether it's a disappearance or it's protecting someone or it's solving 
a murder she's brought in specifically because of her background, because she's a trained investigator. So it doesn't feel strange. It doesn't feel forced. She is there. She is competent. She knows what she's doing. It's not this sort of bumbling, accidental solving. She's she's working hard to to find an answer. Also, as a private investigator, now she gets all kinds of really cool toys. She has, you know, surveillance stuff and internet jammers and she has a huge wardrobe and changes clothes to play different characters if she's being undercover. It's just fun. It's a lens to so much variety within the series. It, it doesn't feel like a formula. It doesn't feel like, oh, here's another book and I know exactly what's going to happen. She gets to do all these different cool things with her training and with her toys and her PI equipment. So she's a great heroine because she's competent. There's still some elements of men folk trying to protect her, but most of them are family. It she's she's stubborn and overrides them easily and it doesn't feel quite so annoying as a woman reading this who hopes to never stumble across a murder to be solved. Um it doesn't feel quite as annoying as some of the others when it comes to the protectiveness. There's a a tad a bit of sort of a paranormal supernatural element. And I just want to put that in there because I know I have some listeners that specifically don't read stories with that element. So I am giving you the heads up that there is one here. It stretches through all the books, but it is not a big focus. It's not a detraction from the rest of the story. It's just sort of a, it, it, there's a bit of a plot device there's an overarching story that, that goes along with it. I think it's done really well. And so I think even if you maybe are skeptical of stories with that sort of thing in it, you know, give the first one a try and, and see what you think. Because I, I think that you'll find, because it's not such a focus, that it, it's not going to bother you. Now, obviously, this being a podcast about food and fiction, it would be silly of me to talk about a series that doesn't have food as a huge focus. And food here really is. Like I, I mentioned before, Liz is a foodie. When Liz goes to a meeting at a restaurant, you're going to get a rundown of that restaurant's menu and you're going to hear what she ordered and you're going to hear what she ate. And I have to say, most of it sounds amazing. I need to research some of these restaurants and find out if they're real because if they are, I'm going to make a beeline to Charleston to try them. There's just, there's really some amazing amazing sounding food. Most of it with a southern spin or a low country spin. You know, lots of fried green tomatoes, pimento cheese, shrimp and grits, biscuits and various kinds of gravy. So certainly it sticks with the theme. It sticks with that low country cuisine feel. But some of it in these restaurants just sound so elevated and so wonderful that I would love to sit down at one of these meals. I think my favorite, she talks, there's a restaurant called Anson. It's a fine dining, fancy restaurant that she's going to on a date. And there's a pork belly dish that she describes with a cordon cheddar waffle, hot pepper jelly, a sunny side up egg, and some succotash. Now, I'll admit, not a succotash fan, but the rest of it sounds absolutely amazing. I actually have some pork belly in my freezer, so that is, this is going to be one of my projects is trying to create this dish. In addition to all the restaurants, food everywhere is a huge family time. It's a huge cultural moment. I think we've talked in every episode so far about food and family and how important food is to family gatherings, how important it is to our time together. Just about everything that we do focuses around food somehow. And this is no different. Her Southern Mama is is sort of a legendary cook. We hear about her fried chicken. We hear about her pimento cheese, which if you have not had pimento cheese, please go find some. It's really delicious. And I'm uh, I love her, her description. Pimento cheese is usually fairly simple, although you can certainly find some elaborate recipes for it. But Mama's pimento cheese is described as, and I'm quoting right from the book here, uh, a rich marriage of five kinds of cheese, mayonnaise, and seven secret ingredients. I don't know what those seven secret ingredients are, but I'm going to do my darndest to figure it out and put something amazing together uh, because pimento cheese really top notch. Grill yourself a pimento cheese sandwich amazing. So the food in the books, while the books are certainly driven by investigations and they're driven by mysteries, they're sometimes driven by a murder, the food becomes almost another character. The food is always present, whether she's stopping in to talk to her police contact and grabbing a mocha latte, or she's grabbing a diet cheer wine from her cooler in her car while on a stakeout to a fancy restaurant to dinner at her mom's place. Food is absolutely sort of the third character or third class of characters. You know, you got your main characters, sort of your secondary supporting characters, and then you've got the food. And of course, you know, you go to the pirate's den, you get a mango margarita and some low country boil, and you are going to be set. I 
I, I highly recommend that you check these books out. Uh, like I said before, the first one starts with Low, Low Country Boil is number one on the, on the list. Now, the series currently has eight books. The ninth book, which is called Low Country Boondoggle, is coming out at the end of June, June 30th, 2020. They're fairly quick reads. You have plenty of time to catch up before the new one comes out. You can also visit the author's website, susanmboyer.com, and she's got some great stuff on there. She's got a map of the island, um, which is always a fun. I love sort of visualizing what I'm looking, what I'm reading about. So check that out. I just really, I hope you check these out. These are really, it's a great series. I really enjoy it. I think you will too. I think, I think you'll, I think you'll get a kick out of it. So thank you everyone for listening today. Uh, thanks for letting me chat about low country and cuisine. Thanks everyone so much. Until next time, keep on feasting. Thanks for listening and for supporting Feasting on Fiction. All the opinions of the panel are ours alone and we're not associated with the media we're discussing in any way. If you'd like to support us, please head over to cookingthebook.com, check out our Patreon and all of our social media. Thanks!